Okay, so let's um, let's drop into this um, Magellan OSM ingestion example. So Spark 2.2 cluster, which you may have to restart and things like that. So once again, um, this is uh, Marina's um, notebook. Um, okay, so uh, remember yesterday she was showing you how you can uh, ingest OpenStreetMap directly into Fugis. Now we're going to ingest OpenStreetMap into Magellan. So, so what she's done is uh, defined an area of interest and find the coordinates of its bounding box. So instead of using the GUI, you can use this uh, um, API OpenStreetMap org um, application programmer interface 0.6 map question mark. So that's uh, that's what today is called state transfer call, and then you give the bounding box in that specific way. That grabs uh, some chunk of Uppsala, I think. Okay. Um, so then there's another one you can do uh, called Tiny Uppsala Centrum. We may not do Tiny Uppsala here, but I'll probably use Tiny Uppsala later on when we get into Markov chains in the foundations course. Okay, let's import a whole bunch of things from Magellan. And then you get, uh, just let's doubly get this Uppsala Centrum um, OpenStreetMap thingy. So it's going to download this XML formatted OpenStreetMap um, stuff. So if you print working directory in ls, there is Uppsala Centrum wgot.osm because I simply named it like that when I did my uh, target name. So otherwise, it'll give you some 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 default name if I want. And then. Um, um, so if I look at data sets, I've got a whole bunch of things. Um, and I think, yeah, you, you probably want, if she's asking you to uncomment this line and make this directory called maps. So for me, that directory already exists. So I'm going to just display what's there. So since Marina was working on this notebook, notebook on the same shard, it's there. So if it's not there, then you have to do this usual copy command, right? Um, so you're just copying this wgot file from the local file system to the distributed file system in this directory you just made. So execute that after you make the directory, and then you should see this. Well, you'll only see one. Okay, so now I, I define my, is everyone there? Okay, let's wait until. Yeah, so Michael, to answer your question, you know, you can also do spark.read uh, instead of SQL context dot whatever format read, right? It's, it's another entryway into uh, Spark 2.2 and above, I think, we can do this. Yeah, it's still the same as your context being called under the hood. So, so now you see we have option uh, type is OpenStreetMap. So Magellan uh, is built to in the ingest uh, OpenStreetMap types. That's what that is. And then you load it from this path where you just put it, put it in. So then when you say show, you start seeing um, um, the data. Right? So yeah, is it a point? Is it a polyline? Is it a polygon? What's the metadata? And so on. So 
So this one says there's a polygon, it's not a polyline, it's not a point, and the metadata says yes, it's a building. Okay. There's electric field, amenity, there's a whole bunch of things in OpenStreetMap for Uppsala, right? So I'm showing the top 20, and this is just showing it in display. And I think the display is busted in Magellan still for this. Yeah, but you still can see in the, if you look at the, the metadata is there? Yeah. yeah. So like if you really want to work with this, you need to parse it in the forum. So. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think this is a display level bug, so we can kind of ignore it. But yeah, you can see some other stuff. So I, I wouldn't worry about the display function that's just specific to Databricks. So if we count Uppsala Centrum OSM data frame that we just made, how many rows are there? There's 29,977. It's just a tiny area around the center, center city. So I thought it'd be really good to have like a mock-up chain of someone getting drunk. I don't know if all the nations are there. It would be a cool project. You should give a whole bunch of drunk kids in the nation cell phones from your project. <laughs> See what... Yeah, I'll skip this. This is a tiny one. Um, just because that's already too big to kind of do simple markup chains and understand. Um, yeah, you don't have to go through that if you don't want. Um, and then what else? Okay, that's it. So that's let's. Uh, oh yeah. So this is visualization with leaflet, which is good. So if you go here. Uh, leaflet uh, examples geo geojson it tells you details about how to uh, read in this geojson uh, formatted file uh, and display it using this JavaScript uh, uh, library called leaflet so this is used uh, quite often and so here what uh, Marina is doing is creating a point with just a couple numbers and then um, She's converting it to a data frame, and uh, then she's making it into a string with the comma, and uh, sort of hand rolling it into a JSON object, basically. Yeah, there is a two JSON method somewhere. Yeah, that's right. I think, but. But let's say it's just one point, so we can just roll out our own JSON string. And, and uh, so what you, what you, if you open this, what you see is basically a function called uh, generate leaflet HTML. It outputs a string, okay? And what's in this function? It has this thing called access token. And... Um, so the access token has to do with uh, yeah mapbox.com. So where is that? I thought you put a link to that. Yeah, I don't know. So anyway, basically you have to go to mapbox. This is just a convenience thing, right? Um, so if you go to is it mapbox? Yeah, so if you go to mapbox.com, you can you know sign up for free, and it they let you let you make so many thousand queries in the 24 hours or something. So you don't need to do all this, but if you want to play around with this, you can do quite quite a cool set of leaflet animations and stuff. This is all in display HTML. You can pop out in Databricks or do something more delicate. But what I did is I I signed in, got put my email. ID, blah, 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 and they sent me that little string, which is my access token. This is mine, right? I don't know, whatever. It doesn't matter, you know, it's just, um, so yeah, so basically, and then I'm basically taking my generate leaflet HTML with no arguments or anything, it's all hard-coded, and then um, displaying HTML. So it, it uses that uh, token and goes to leaflet and, and grabs the bounding, you know, little bounding box around the point. So I guess that's where we are, right? On strong. Just to show that uh, later on, you know, we use leaflets you know, for Beijing. Okay, that's just a quick thing about GeoJSON, leaflet, Magellan, ingestion of OSM XML files. Yeah. 
Is anyone else having problems? Yeah, I don't know. Let's let's not worry about it because I don't know. Maybe it's some code in the same or something. Okay. Um, okay. So let's. Um, so we did this already. Oh no, we didn't. So I just I'm gonna let you uh, watch uh, new window. I think this should hopefully launch directly at where uh, Victor Ingman was doing this. That's Victor. So he basically went through Ram's 2018 2016 talk and is repeating the New York taxi examples from scratch. Um, so anyway, he kind of said it took him about 50 minutes to figure it out. So he's doing all of the stuff carefully with schemas and stuff like that. So um, that's what he did. He's a pretty quick guy, actually. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to, you know, just uh, if you want to get into Ram's New York City example, you can kind of follow this. Yeah, and I remember he he tried to do it for the latest taxi thing for 20, but then the New York taxi guys changed their formatting, so he just went back to the old year of data that Ram was using. Using so anyway, it doesn't matter. So that's there. So, um, but then for us, it's not rich enough because it's only the starting and drop pick up and drop off points. So we want a bit richer stuff. Now. What did uh, let's see? So I'm not going to run these cells because uh, I don't know if the dependencies are too complex. But let me go in sort of this uh, pedagogical order, um, and I'll make sure these work in a 
few days. So this is a scalable spatiotemporal constraint satisfaction problem or SPCSP problem, right? So a lot of things that uh, John and Marina are uh, talking about from an arithmetic point of view are this class of problems, right? Remember, John had these prisms and you know some polygon shapes and some the z-axis was time, right? And you, know, you can have cylinders of those polygons, you know, cylindrical extensions of those polygons, or if you have some uncertainty in time, there are these prisms and all sorts of shapes he was describing. That's essentially a spatiotemporal set that some trajectory may pass through, right? So we want to be able to do those operations in a generic way. And we're going to leverage Magellan for spatial operations, and then we'll use just time intervals uh, using just uh, classical uh, Spark SQL. We'll have a new a separate column for time intervals, and then we'll mix them in, in uh, Spark SQL. So the map problem is like this. Suppose you have base spatial sets in 2D. These can be anything, points, lines, polygons, etc. And they're given by uh, capital S sub i uh, as i goes from 1 to m. So there's some S sets, geometries, and m, uh, m geometries. And then I also have um, uh, 1D time intervals. So there is a base temporal set in 1D given by uh, intervals in time, right? And so um, I think that's a typo. So that should also be M, I believe. Uh, is that true? No, it does not. Yeah, it need not be. So yeah, the, the time intervals are just uh, time intervals. You know, the, the right endpoint is bigger than the left or equal to the right endpoint, left endpoint. So I basically have this kind of a picture. And so I have uh, uh, some time intervals. So I don't know, T sub under bar, super I sub I, T sub over bar sub I, you know, and I goes from 1 to N, so you can have 1, and then T sub 2, T super 2, and so on. Let's say it's also N for now. So that's my, my, my and let's make this a, instead of a set, let's say this is sequential. So it goes from 1 to n. So this is just a definition. So then the same way I have a S, right? Some geometry, some set. So let's say uh, sort of same size. Then one can obtain space-time set in 3D as unions of Cartesian products of such base, spatial, spatial, and temporal sets. So what is a Cartesian product? So basically, I take this time interval, and for every point here and every point here, I create like a, this is what this is a generalization of the notion of prism. John was talking about. If this is a circle, this is an interval that will be a cylinder. If this is some kind of weird polygon and this is the prime interval, it will be another thing. Right? So that's what I mean by spatiotemporal sets. So these will be in three dimensions, 2D, space, 1D is time. And the union of them, right? So there'll be, you know, so time axis is here, there's some space. So there'll be these little cylindrical polygonal or lines if, if the base set is a point floating around. And that's what we want. Um, as our union. Um, so now a simple constraint satisfaction problem can be posed as a Boolean valued statement. So it's true or false involving such space time sets. So we can say, here's my set of trajectories like Uber rides going, going through space and time. So there'll actually be little polylines in 3D, right? Uber. And then, um, and then I want to know, find me all the, all the rides that intersect in uh, some uh, space uh, and time set. So in Ram's talk, he was only talking about the neighborhoods, which are fixed, right? And implicitly in Ram's thing, the the time, the temporal dimension is 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 all of time. So he basically, you know, he didn't distinguish time too much. So here we can say, I'm only interested in all the taxi rides that are in South of Market uh, five minutes uh, after ten. For example, this is basically thing. 
Okay, so uh, yeah, again, this is uh, yeah for multiple entities. Find a set of entities or taxis or whatever that intersect with a given space-time set or a collection of space-time sets. Find the set of entities that were close to one another based on their trajectories during a given period of time. This is the buffered operation. We can say, you know, whatever. Uh, you can drop a bunch of points, buffer them, and say, give me all the trajectories that were close together, right? So this could be you know, all the taxis that were back to back and some traffic jam or whatever you want. Uh, and then this is what you kind of, uh, this is one way of looking at co-occurrences in this, in this representation, you know. Uh, find entities that are spatio-temporally inconsistent. So for us, like some of this, a lot of this stuff is the open source end of some of the stuff I was doing. So this one, so Dylan was actually uh, an undergrad, kind of like Olaf now, working, working on his honors thesis, and so he did a lot of the coding for this. So for us, the main problem was, you know, there was um, so a lot of software we were selling at the time for this company. We, we were uh, selling it to government agents, mm -hmm. and there was this famous case of a of a TV convict who escaped the prison and took the flight to Australia. I mean, New Zealand, we don't check anything. We just go inside any trash lab or walk out. <laughs> um, so anyway, it's uh, that's great. Um, New Zealand's a nice place, but obviously, you know, the big news and like, how come this didn't you know pop up in the in the immigration officer screen, right? Because this guy's supposed to be in a prison. Anyway, uh, so we, you know, whatever, this kind of pitch to the government agencies that were in New Zealand was that, look, we can actually detect uh, inconsistencies on your data sets by very simple, right? Like one person cannot be in two places at the same time problem, right? So that was one of the main things to just uh, have, so, you know, to find inconsistencies on uh, data from different uh, departments of a government that wants to cooperate in merging the data. Okay, so a lot of this particular data set uh, uh, we're supposed to be working with, it's kind of busted in many levels, is originally from Microsoft's uh, research on Beijing, Beijing taxi trajectories in those two papers I showed you. And so this is an old paper, Yu Zheng is one of the main authors. So the, the, the papers are there and then the data set is there, but then when Microsoft migrated to OneDrive, for some reason there were 14, um, there were 14 files. And uh, for some reason, um, yeah, this one's sort of busted, but they, the, okay, you'll see. Some of the zip files are missing right now, so I don't know, um, there's only one zip file left. So originally the step was to download the taxi trips. These are not going to work because you need a lot more libraries, but just kind of follow it so conceptually for now. So we, we have to, for example, these are new things that are coming in. Uh, com.cotdp, Hadoop, zip file input format. Remember I said you can actually load zip files in the compressed state in Hadoop and read them in the compressed state. That's kind of getting quite close to industrial strength processing now. Uh, it's basically the same. Uh, we use text files mostly to keep things easy. So here is the, okay, so I was asking for Ivan's help. So Ivan Sadikov is this other guy in New Zealand that sort of helps me out. Sometimes I get stuck. Um, anyway, there was not a lot of time. So, um, so anyway, I, I went here, I looked at this, Microsoft changed its uh, whatever stuff. But then uh, I was able to grab one zip file, so it's loaded there. Yeah, this will work. Okay, so at least there's one zip file of a bunch of taxi trajectories instead of 14. There originally were 14 of them. Uh, can this notebook be made to work on the data downloaded? Anyway, by before midnight, ended ST, no. So, it, well, we will fix it, right? But the problem is, yeah, we, we are missing the files and um, if the files were downloadable in the original place, like here, before they moved to OneDrive, this is literally the command. You can zip the URLs, uh, and then once you have a vector of all the URLs where the zip files are, you can just do something simple as this. I can just go from one until the number of zip files, and then I'm just creating uh, uh, a new file, um, file reader, and then I can download the files like this. 
So this is very powerful. For example, the same thing will work in a, not a hardcore way, but in a pretty reasonable way to, to download the zip files from the GDELT streams, right? Because there's timestamp zip files and so on. So anyway, this is basically what, uh, so this took about six minutes in 2016. And then we load these zip files into DBFS as usual. And then you will have like a whole bunch of these Beijing taxi trajectories. Uh, so now we sort of turn these zip files into RDDs. So, um, so basically we have these zip file RDDs, which are um, Spark context. See, now we're using this new API Hadoop file. Uh, this is uh, um, the, the particular imports and the libraries we need. But then it, they're now specifying it's a class of zip file input format, class of text. It's actually a text file that's been zipped. And then it's a class of bytes writable. And, okay. So this is how you would read zip files, basically. Okay? And then you can create a zip file RDD that you can start processing. Because you don't really want to like decompress and recompress and all of this, right? You just want to have direct streams. And for text files, it's easy because it just does something like zcat on the fly. So it'll kind of catenate and. Um, so yeah, if you basically do this uh, and you, um, um, you you collect, so this is basically the contents of the zip file. The, so each zip file ha is a folder with lots and lots of uh, text files in it. And um, yeah, so the file contents, so if you look at one particular file or content, uh, it's like this. So there is, uh, yeah, so there's basically that's the first row. Uh, it's some ID of the trip or taxi, uh, date, timestamp, and then long and lat or lat and long. Right, so that's quite a lot of information, right? Because that immediately with timestamp and location, you automatically have speed, and, and then if you can overlay that on some Beijing's OpenStreetMap, which again we don't want to do by XML. You'll see later because it's too big. So we we, we will use another format from OSM that you can get called up uh, Google's uh, what is it called? Protocol buffer format. So it's a it's another format. Then it's kind of um, so it'll it'll let you, um, you know, essentially uh, overlay the OpenStreetMap on top of these trajectories. So let's see. Here I'm just displaying the lines, turning them into a data frame, and so yeah. So here to um, so this is all old Magellan as well. This is like 2016 Magellan uh, that she used to work on a different version. So what I'm also importing is this Java SQL timestamp. This is like vanilla Java timestamp class. That's how we're going to define our keys. Okay. So that's basically and um, yeah and and also like remember I kind of rolled out all of this for you, but that's really you can just use Magellan Cord Nat eighty three or you can also drop into Esri and get, get the transformation from Esri. So you don't have to go and code like I was doing. And that was just to, yeah, just to see what was going on. So then I'm making a case class called the taxi record. So this is basically my taxi ID, which is the first column timestamp, which is the second column, and then the point, right, that long. And uh, so then, yeah, so we, we just, um, so then we use this date format as the uh, as a as a new simple date format. This is in this um, Java SQL timestamp thing. So we have to specify how the format is: year, month, day, hour, minute, second. So that when it reads that string, it'll automatically encode it in the right uh, timestamp. Yeah, I mean generally it's a good idea to make it into Unix timestamps because. You know, here we're only looking at trajectories from the same local time, so it doesn't really matter too much. So now the goal is to parse the data line by line, splitting by commas and casting to the correct data types, wrapping it in a try-catch block in case there's some invalid data, right? Um, and uh, discarding them. Okay, so but this is kind of boilerplate uh, Scala. So I have my taxi data, which takes my lines right so this is line by line stuff and then it maps each line into 
my try catch block and my try I, I have my val where I split um, the each line into parts and then I have my ID as parts of zero to an int right because that's the taxi ID and my time is parts of one and I'm creating my a Magellan point by using parts of two and parts of three because I think this one the lap, long lap was in the right order and then I made my case class right so I can now create my taxi record ID time and, and point so this is great and then uh, and then I can catch it right uh, so case e uh, so it's throwable if uh, you know if uh, if none of these things work basically right um, so then I, I I just specify my ID to be negative one so if I cannot create a taxi record uh, like upstairs in the try then I'm going to drop here I'm going to make bogus points negative one negative one uh, ID minus one and some bogus timestamp so then I know how many are busted so then I convert that to a data frame and all of this will work automatically because of the case class so then I select the taxi ID um, and then convert it to some Unix timestamp uh, timestamp and then I get my point and I repartition it to 100. So this kind of step is super important. If your Spark job is like super slow, it's not because Spark, no. yeah, usually not because Spark sucks. It's usually because your partition number is wrong for the cluster you have under your hood. Because you see, initially the partition may be, because you know, you're reading these huge zip files and stuff, right? And doing all these things. So it will create some number of partitions. Uh, using its heuristic under the hood, those partitions will cascade into the lineage trees and transformations that come up downstream. So when you drop a lot of data or you make it very different, uh, that may not be the optimal partitioning strategy. So you may have to repartition. Um, that's kind of a function of how much communication overhead you have, and it's a bit of an art. But um, yeah, so now I basically filter out all the taxi IDs that are. Uh, not minus one so I just drop all the ones that failed and I think that number was not too big so we didn't really care so now you can show the taxi data and this is basically you know sort of you're ready to inject start playing in spark right done all the ingestion with zips and um, uh, yeah so this was also at that time bleeding edge but anyway um, so at that time, yeah, the data types defined by Magellan cannot be stored in Parquet, and so there's a lot of work around. So this whole thing should be probably cleaned up. Um, so then we define these help, helper functions, right? Point to tuple, which takes a Magellan point and converts into an array of point dot x and point dot y, because if you want to store it as Parquet, we have to drop into doubles, and this is all like, uh, yeah. Don't worry about these things. Um, it's just a way to just quickly write to Parquet. We want to write to Parquet because we did all this hard work, like reading all the zip files, doing all this error correction, blah, 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 blah. And then we want to be happy to just read from a polymer Parquet with the right number of partitions. So then when we come back, we don't have to... Now to do some more... Yeah, so you can just start from here. You can just read from Parquet and continue. So this was the, the taxi count data. So let's see how many uh, rows there are in total. 17.7 million, right? So this was kind of a big deal in 2006 or something. So first for additional functionality, you use the S3 geometry API. So this is essentially already bundled in that Magellan assembly jar for you. Um, but you can also call Esri library separately. Esri geometry library is fine, you can add it. Um, so it's basically what uh, Magellan uses under the hood for things in a single machine setting. So you would import uh, Esri points. Uh, so these are, you know, um, Esri geometry, spatial reference, and this geodesic distance uh, transformations and things like this. So we don't want to recode any of this. So all of Esri is at our disposal here. So that's basically the open source part of uh, ArcGIS. Uh, so then this is uh, some Scala, you know, so we, we want to implicitly convert from Magellan point to an Esri point. Again, all of this may not be needed for the new version of Magellan, but uh, that's got some pedantic value, right? Um, so I would 
basically convert this to an ESRI point because the ESRI operations at the time we were doing only worked on ESRI points. So we wanted a quick way to just babble between Magellan points and ESRI points. But now I think it's all rolled nicely in the new version of Magellan, which I haven't descended into. So now is the outlining of the geospatial constraint satisfaction problem. Um, so the problem being addressed is can, um, can be considered as finding trajectories that satisfy some uh, constraints on time and space, right? So these can be visualized in three dimensions and lat long and time and the trajectory segments that intersect these objects. So what we then do here is uh, to begin with, we first define a circle data type to represent circular regions in space. The circle is defined in terms of its center and radius. So we kind of roll this out as a case class, but you can use the buffer type in Magellan now, which wasn't implemented at the time. Um, then a, a point then intersects with the circle when the distance between the point and the circle center is less than its radius. Because we rolled our own classes, we can really quickly define predicates, right? This is just an inequality statement check. Okay, so then um, this particular function, intersect circle, is now defined as a user-defined function. So we can go from columns and data frame to other columns. So this user-defined function takes a center, which is a Magellan point, and a radius, which is a double, um, and then a point that we are interested in knowing whether it's falling in that center. And then uh, we, we basically uh, first, you know, this is on uh, W, what is w, WGS84? Okay. It's basically in degrees, so you can't find like, that square. Oh, yeah. Square yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, so to measure distances, you need to, like, yeah, precast that. And that's all this is. And it, so it's just, you know, finding it in that uh, uh, local projection, and then, then it's just asking, um, yeah, if that's less than this radius in, in whatever units, meters, or the feet, or whatever. Uh, so then we have some generic functions below, uh, defined for geospatial CSP. Uh, yeah, so anyway, this is <laughs> getting into Scala, right? So there's things called traits and seal traits. And so this is all uh, Dylan stuff, like I really, um, you know. So let's, let's look at it functionally. So to make things generic, we define a trait called space-time volume. There are advantages to defining your own traits, okay? So space-time volume is uh, it's kind of the interface for our CSP functionality. Then the specific functionality for each type of geometric region is defined in the case classes that extend this trait, okay? So it gives us a very generic way of talking about these, these uh, Cartesian products. So yeah, that's a seal trait called uh, space-time volume, and in there there are these uh, functions. So you have something called get intersecting trips. So get intersecting trips has a trajectories uh, that comes in as a data frame, and it has a start timestamp, end timestamp, okay, and then um, and then it it outputs uh, a data frame, right? And uh, there is another one called points intersecting time. This takes uh, trajectories as a day frame, start timestamp, end timestamp. And what it does is uh, it takes the trajectories and simply filters it by the timestamp uh, of the trajectory being greater than the start time and being less than the start. It's, just, it's, it's nothing, right? It's just double booleans checking, so the uh, timestamp checking. Okay, so now, so this way you see we separate the, the, the time containment from the space containment, and that's very nice because then the time containment is just standard SQL, so it'll, it'll get pushed down, and um, so we, we, we kind of can use that, and then only the trajectories that are sort of satisfying the time constraints, then we play the, the space constraints. So it's just a slight twist on standard Magellan now. No, like it's all in timestamps, right? So timestamp is its own class, so it's a Java timestamp thing. So you can think of it as some some representation of time that you can spit it out as a string in a special format or as a millisecond long or whatever, right? So it's just uh, yeah, you can just abstract it as timestamp. 
in lawns. Mm -hmm. And then it's just a convenient way of, um, you know, and then there's a circle container. So the circle container basically takes a data frame of circles. Um, it has a start time and an end time. And what it's doing is now it's extending the space-time volume. So that's kind of a, uh, a nice thing, right? So the space-time volume is our sort of sealed trait. So these specific circle containers and um, polygon containers and so on are extending space-time volume. This is not, of course, in Scala, but I, I don't. I want to slightly demystify this. There's not a lot going on, okay? So it's a nice um, habit of coding this way. Um, um, in C++, there's some kind of inheritance and stuff. Okay, so um, so basically, again and again, what you're going to be getting is, you know, you have um, this get intersecting trips, which will uh, which will play with time, and then you're going to have the spatial joints. So if it's polygons, if polygon joins circles, it's circle joins, and so on. So here we're only doing circles and polygon uh, shapes, right? So our S's are only yeah, circles and some are with three polygons. So that's enough. Um, but you can kind of explode this. And then, uh, so our little example is basically taxis going past Tiananmen Square, right? So, so for this, uh, to show the result, I mean, we just dropped the points on Google Maps and found these coordinates and sort of, uh, so and we know those are the uh, GWS84 or whatever uh, representation of Tiananmen Square, you know, where there was all this protest in the 80s, right? And the Chinese government reacted with tanks. I don't know if you guys remember that. So, yeah, so I mean, that's, that's all we're doing here, right? So now we do polygon data frame and polygon container and um, and we see simply, um, you know, create our polygon record, you know, uh, by using my Tiananmen Square uh, array. And this is, remember, Magellan's polygon, which needs to say there is only one polygon st starting at index zero, because that's an array starting at zero. It's all the same stuff. So we convert that to a data frame, and now we have this polygon data frame. So that shows me this uh, Tiananmen Square as a polygon data frame. And this is the leaflet thingy. Uh, I won't run it, but if you sort of look in here, um, so I think it's the same map box thing. Um, yeah, so you know it has some other key from a while back. I don't know if it still works, but um, if you see, I'm just passing in this polygon, right? We did this point example. So, of course, the animation shows you can go crazy on this um, leaflet stuff. So that's. Uh, that's Beijing, that's Tiananmen Square. Well, I don't know. We kind of dropped it somewhere else. Maybe it's, yeah, I think this is Tiananmen Square, maybe. Is there any Chinese here? Is this Tiananmen Square? Oh, sorry, we, oops. I don't know, we did it in, on Google Map, we did it correctly, but, okay. So, it's just south of Tiananmen Square now. Um, so yeah, and then, you know, this is just a demo, right? So you can have a start time and end time, we kind of, peaked already and looked at some, some trajectories. So this is 2008 uh, data. And um, yeah, so we just, basically it's one minute, right? In one minute interval. So get intersecting trips is simply like that. So polygon DF, get intersecting trips, and you can pass in taxi data and start time and end time. So this is all the trajectories now hit against this. And it's really no biggie, it's just, doing this timestamp thing on top of the, what Ram was doing. Okay, so of course I can do this at scale. I can have like, as long as I limit myself to the circles and polygon types, I can start, you know, having a whole bunch of them and hit all the trajectories against them. Uh, I'm, I'm doing it here. And if you see, these are the, these are the taxi IDs. That's, that's quite a lot of taxis in one minute, right? In that little part of Beijing. So Beijing is pretty busy. Um, yeah, so these are just some, some statistics of this stuff. Sorry, I can't, I, you know, I don't want to waste time doing this live because I think bits and bobs are busted. So now what I really want to do next is map matching. Maybe this is the more important thing, right? So this was, I think, the second example in Brown's talk. So he was talking about how GPS trajectories are noisy, right? If you sort of it's a, it's, a, it's a real problem, so we can't just like do epsilon corrections or anything, right? So we have some 
some roadways or whatever, a cycleways or something. And if you actually look at your cell phone data that comes out, it won't be perfectly on this. You know, it'll be like this. It'll be something like this. Who knows? Right. And he was sort of <coughs> talking about map matching as a basic problem of correcting errors. So if you know that this person, so, so the first problem usually is um, activity detection. So if you read these um, MSR papers. So this is our activity here means like a, a transportation mode. So are, are they biking, walking, you know, vehicles, blah, 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 uh, train. So, so it's very similar to Amira's talk, okay? So you will have like training data or, or you will have some, some idea from historical data or simply looking at OpenStreetMap ways, you can figure out all these cycle ways. You'll have to do something. But then you can detect the activity, which again, you know, Ram says once you know uh, the, you know, if, if it's a, if it's a, you know, a highway, say South Dakota, highway 91, I think. I mean, that's just straight, right? It's like 90 miles per hour speed limit. So that's a very trivial map matching problem. So the GPS trajectories might be like this, but then you know, say people are going at speed limit or roughly plus or minus 10 miles per hour, then you basically map match like this, right? And then you would make sure that. The distance traveled in some timestamp. Timestamps are pretty good. Uh, is is maintaining some constant speed. So this is basically what map matching is: snapping to the nearest uh, way segment. And um, but then yeah, uh, so so this is not a trivial problem. Uh, doing it at scale, and so we're just using some 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 libraries for doing map matching under the hood, and there's quite a lot going on. Uh, especially doing map matching at scale, you have to represent these roadways as sort of a contraction, contraction hierarchies. Again, a lot of research from Microsoft on this. Um, but we are going to black box it. I just have pointers into it. According to Dylan, this works uh, before he went to bed. So I'm going to try hit enter. But it won't work for you because I don't even know the exact library dependencies. But let me see if it works for me first. Um, so this is just the Wikipedia article on map matching. Okay, so you basically, yeah, this is the actual trajectory. That's the road, so you know it's off. So you have to somehow snap it. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's the other sort of modeling reason is it, it sort of reduces to so-called graph dimensionality reduction um, because then if you see if, if, if instead of allowing these points to be an arbitrary point in the in the plane, which they aren't, if you snap them on this graph, then you can now only represent the dynamics or you know, whatever model you have on this network, right? So once you have this representation on network, the network can be projected into uh, you know, a, a finite state Markov chain using this lumping argument. So this, you know, right? so, so it, has a, it has a natural computational element to it and a, obviously a privacy element to it. You can sort of really go after it. Um, okay, and then, yeah. Yeah, so, so it's usually the first step. So we're using this thing called graph hopper. It started out a bunch of German undergrads, I thought, started this open source project when we were looking at it. It's quite good. I think, I don't know if they've commercially branched off now. It's Apache 2 licensed still. Um, yeah, so graph hopper is this sort of Java library. So remember anything in Java, we can suck in Scala. So, um, yeah, so we, we, we played around with a lot of things, including BMW's open source thing, which, uh, yeah, so we, we were happy with this. And at that time, I had access to a very, very powerful research shard uh, in Canterbury, which started low. So we had these very ambitious plans to like do continent scale map matching and stuff, which is possible because if you have access to a lot of Amazon machines, just from the same Databricks shard, you can launch a lot of them, and each one can have up to you know 120 gigs of RAM. And with 120 gigs of RAM, you can actually represent very, very large chunks of, you know, so say Sweden. So you want to do all of Sweden, right? 
uh, all, all the vehicles moving in Sweden all the time, <laughs> map match them in real time. This, this graph hopper will let you do it as long as you have RAM in a single machine. So it does all this magic, it does the data structures to, to do the snapping, right? But how do you distribute it? You have to do a graph hopper process in each of the worker nodes, okay? And then you have to somehow uh, marry them together. That's kind of what this notebook is trying to do. Exactly, that's what it's trying to do. Yeah, this is BMW's barefoot. I haven't chased this in a couple of years. I don't know where what the state of this is. Um, anyway, um, so here's the steps in this worksheet. The basic steps are the following. You have to attach the needed libraries, load OpenStreetMap data, and initialize graph hopper. Um, these last two steps need to be done only once, so that's downstairs. And then we have to set up leaflet for visualization, then load the table of Uber data from the earlier analysis, then convert to an RDB for map matching. And then we have to start the map matching, display results of map match trajectories, and then uh, do the following two steps once in a given cluster. Well, that's basically uh, step zero now. So yeah, I think I changed all these ordering. So this I think is called zero. Um, yeah, so this is basically step zero. Um, so let's 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 maybe see what's let's be brave. It's supposed to work. Um, I don't know. Let me see if it works for me first. Um, where are we? So that's step two of zero, and this is step one of zero. Here. So let's try. Yeah, so this is step 0 0.1, the other one is step 0 0.2. So so first what I what you so I tried this, don't hit this button, because uh so I went to this bike BBB bike that we only found out about yesterday. Where is that? You know this one? Marina uh, told us about this to get uh, OpenStreetMaps because I've never gone there. Uh, so I was just playing with this this more uh, la late last night. So I grabbed this San Francisco one, which if you see, there are so many different formats, right? So if you look at it, uh, we were playing with the XML format, which is these, uh, what is it called? .osm.xml, do you see it? Oh boy. Anyway, what form, the format we want, so these are all compressed formats. So we really want this one, right? Um, so don't download or anything right now. Uh, San Francisco.osm.protocol uh, buffer format. This is a Google format. And it's 16.2 MB, okay? So I did this and <laughs> my, my driver crashed because I, you know, because the map matching graph hopper creates this crazy data structure in random access memory <laughs> that just blew my head off my driver. So then, um, then I don't know, so I was sort of right before my shower, <laughs> Dylan was like, ah, oh, this is bad, it's crashing. So what I did is, uh, I, I, you know, if you play around, it tells you what to do. Like if you want to grab a specific area, so then I just grab this tiny chunk of San Francisco, like I'm just zoomed into San Francisco right now. It lets you like uh, pick a region. So, and I kind of try to make it a tiny one, see? So we're not going to get all the Uber trajectories, but at least it's not going to hopefully blow my, my gasket on my on my uh, RAM. Uh, you know, of course, you know, if you have more RAM, you can do all of San Francisco easily, but that's a different problem. So I basically uh, downloaded this file, in, and then uh, we can also try and curling, curling it directly. They block wget, so there's the two main ways to get, fetch something. Uh, so, so you can use this thing called curl. Uh, which is basically doubly get. So they they did allow doubly get. So maybe let me, let me comment this because you kind of don't want to do it unless you have some big machine. I mean, more than six gigs of RAM or whatever. You, uh, or you have to set the change the settings in the in the driver uh, when you start the the spark. So I think I have two of them. So. Uh, uh, there's a, you know, so if I, if I do this, so, you know, when you, when you choose the bounding box, it gives you planet underscore negative 122, 
you know, the, the long lap, long lap for the bounding box for the whole planet, and that's basically that part of San Francisco. So that's what I curled, and I think I curled another one, which is much, much smaller. It's a tinier one, just to keep a couple versions. And, um, and I don't know, I just, so you, you know, you can try one of these. I think the last one, if you want, uh, this should work. Um, so you can then download it. And so that's my, and then while well, I just loaded that into my, um, I made a directory called datasets, graph hopper, open street maps. And then I basically moved that file into there using my name called San Francisco small. You, you, know, you can name it whatever you want. So now um, that's what's here. So if I open this, I have a San Francisco, uh, which is a smallish one, and then San Francisco small is the really tiny one. So you can see the sizes, right? Initially, mine was huge. It was over 16 megs compressed. Uh, and then I made this uh, directory uh, called uh, graph hopper graph hopper data so that's basically the directory where graph graph hopper will store its data you know in, in all the workers and then um, yeah so then I um, I have to do this open street Ma uh, OSM path so this tells me where the San Francisco uh, you know OpenStreetMap uh, protocol buffer format file is in the distributed file store, and then where Graph Graph Hopper can dump its uh, its own data that it's creating out of that. So once that's done, um, so yeah, so Dylan just did this uh, a few hours ago, and then the so you know maybe someone can follow along and see if. if if it works, um, so it'll 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 kind of start breaking here, right? Because you don't have a graph hopper library. So um, just spend a few minutes on this. So let me go and look at my cluster uh, and see what's there. So where are we? So let me look at the clusters. Um, so this is a cluster of nine libraries. And so I have something called map matching minus 0 0.6.0. 0. Uh, you definitely need this, I know. You need osmosis OSM binary 0 0.45. Because we're using Osmosis, which is another library that uh, that ingests OpenStreetMap data, so you you, you know um, so you can have that library, and also you need OSM PBF 0.45. So I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to 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 grab this guy OSM Osmosis PBF. So this is in Maven coordinates. And then uh, this one, Osmosis OSM binary 0 0.45. Don't choose 0 0.46 or any other version. Yeah, could you zoom in a little bigger? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we spent hours on <laughs> stupid stuff could like you this. Some more? Some more? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yes, it's osmosis. So if you just search for osmosis, you'll get a whole bunch of things. Yeah. Right, so maybe I'll write it down because if I zoom in at this level, we can't see the other one you need with this graph uh, hopper. Or some. Uh, Osmosis uh, PDF. So this is the portable buffer format. It's 0 
make it tiny bit smaller so and then this map matching 0 0.6.0 Yeah. Yeah. Maybe for Marina. Um, I don't recall if we need, need spray JSON for this, but let's not worry about it until something doesn't work. And you guys already have graph frames, so. And you also have Magellan assembly. Yeah, you may need this. I'll write this down. So, Esri geometry, but don't don't load the other one. Just load one. I mean, basically osmosis plus one, two, graph author as three. Um, so let's come back to these if things don't work. And then uh, spray this in. We may need this function. Okay, so so does everyone have uh, these three libraries? No. Not yet. Yeah, so this guy has quite a lot of artifacts that it pulls in. Um, I'll make this a bit smaller so I can't see anything. Yeah, after all these library uh, imports, I, I don't think it works. So you have the right version of 0 0.60. So is it this one or this one? It's uh, just map matching off of it. Is it a problem if you choose a later version? I'm we'll saying you spent literally four and a half hours until 3 a.m. today. Oh, okay. Don't, we'll well, see. you can, but it won't work. Yeah, okay, we'll see. It's, there's all too many dependencies, and we simply haven't had the time to break everything up. But, uh, yeah, so that's why I'm telling you. I could have made a big Uber jar and loaded it magically for you, but this is a little more useful <laughs> in the long run. Uh, I, And in fact, I haven't tested whether the notebook works. Okay, so let's sort of uh, see if things actually work. Um, okay, so so can you guys go all the way down and see? Um, you can.
So you can um, initialize the graph hopper. So, so once you've downloaded the data, um, you should be able to do that. And I'm just here. Yeah, I don't know. Ah, yes, of course not. So uh, there is an import all the way on the top, probably a missing. So let's just uh, this is an annoying thing about notebooks, I should say. Right, so so I should hit this. Oh yes, actually, yeah. You need spray JSON, guys. Sorry, you need one more library. Um, so yeah, this import should work. So then, then all the libraries are there. So um, I'll show you spray JSON again. Um, yeah, patch. So you also want. Spray JSON 2.11-1.3 point whatever, 1.3.4. Um, Yeah, great. So, you know, um, if all your imports work, uh, let's see. Are you set, Don? Do you have spray JSON and map matcher? Yeah, the last one. I don't know, no, not yet. I, I, so far, no, but maybe. But if you want, go for it, I don't know. Uh, but I'm sort of trying to, um, I don't recall. Um, okay, so maybe in the interest of time, I'm gonna try to go forward, okay. Um, So because I imported all the libraries successfully, this should work. Okay, great. So what I've done is uh, I've set up this uh, instance of the graph, graph hopper class where I'm uh, you know, flushing the store and I don't know, various encoding and, and I'm giving the set OSM file to be the OSM path where the OSM uh, protocol buffer file lives. And I'm also giving it this graph hopper location where graph hopper needs to store stuff. Okay. Yeah, and um, so that's basically step 0 uh, 0.2. You know, I call this 2 here. This should be step 0 0.2. And once again, you only need to do this once for each OSM file. Um, right. So then you should be able to display and see these things, right? So, um, so, so we should move this graph hopper object. So what is this? So graph hopper consumes this OSM PDF file and creates all kinds of metadata and writes it to another file locally. But now you want this graph hopper file with all this uh, data structures to be accessible to all the nodes, all the worker nodes. That's all you're doing here. You're making sure it's accessible in the distributed file store. So you do that and then uh, just make sure that um, um, 
So if you see what's in uh, DBFS, datasets, graph hopper, graph hopper data, you start seeing that this is how it's, you know, it, it has all this, uh, you know, subdirectories for edges and geometry, location names, I don't know, it's doing something to represent the OpenStreetMap data uh, in, a, in a clever way for its snapping and map matching routines. So let me kind of go back to the top and run through this because I uh, have one more notebook I want to go through. Um, okay. Yeah, so all of this works, right? Um, yeah, it's okay. So this is. So now, um, next you need to do the following, only one. So we did this, setting up the leaflet for visualization. So um, once again, this is the get leaflet HTML thing. See, now I've defined this as a function. So if you just see before, remember we were hard coding things, but now uh, if I just uh, oops, show code, Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Yeah, when it's dot, 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 it's this weird plus thing you have to hit. So you see I'm passing in features as an array of strings. And so now I'm going to kind of turn this generate leaflet HTML into a generic thing that I can pass in arbitrary sequences of strings. And it's going to somehow, so all, all I have to do is figure out where is this features thingamajig going. So I'm doing a, a features array, which basically I'm doing some kind of string concatenation. And I have no idea, but... It, it sort of generates a, a whole bunch of basic things I'll be passing in. So it's much more general than uh, than the, the hard-coded point and, and little polygon we did earlier. So then I'll load Uber data as in the earlier analysis, then convert to an RDD for map matching. So I exactly repeat of the Uber thingamajig. So I essentially have my case class Uber record as trip ID timestamp. Uh, lap long, it's an array of doubles, and then um, you know, creating a data frame. Uh, and um, so, if I display, I get this strip ID timestamp uh, and lap long. So, next, we're going to be considering uh, a trip to be invalid when it contains less than two data points. Uh, this is required by graph hopper because a graph hopper only does the map matching for trajectories with at least two data points. Okay, so that's the filter. So that's Uber counts filtered. These are the valid trips. So here are the valid trip IDs. So I, I make sure that I don't have trip IDs that are in the undefined input case for graph hopper. So that's all that is. Uh, next, we're going to uh, join the list of valid IDs with the original data set. So only the entries for those trips contained in the Uber counts filtered are there. Right? So this is, um, just calling this Uber valid data. Right? So it's just a subset of the trip IDs. Uh, so and then I just want, just want to see how many data points were dropped. So, so there's a few out of how many? It was 99,000 trips or something? I don't know. How many trip IDs were there in the internet? Mm -hmm. It's a lot more than 355. <laughs> um, so yeah, so here's my, my uh, Uber valid data. Right, so it's just showing lots of trip IDs. And, uh, good. So graph offer considers a trip to be a sequence of latitude, longitude, and time tuples. So, um, the, so the relevant columns are selected from the data frame, and then the rows are mapped to key value pairs with the trip ID as the key. After this is done, the reduce by key operation merges all the lap long time arrays for each key because you know this is called ses sessionization. So the same problem when a user comes to a website and you have their ever cookie or whatever, you want to make sure that the behavior of that user is mapped to that user key. It's kind of the same thing, um, right? So that there's uh, 
one entry for each trip ID containing all the relevant data points. So Dylan says change to use SQL API instead of RDD API. All right, this is what we were doing. So, so this is Dylan's original code and I don't know. Let's try this. So he's commented out something. Okay, this is the RDD API. I think this is, yeah, if you want to use the more newer stuff. It's just, this is good enough for us. So now I have my ubers.count. So I have uh, 24, 644 valid trip IDs. Okay, because now my array of double double longs, uh, right, um, long lat timestamp as long is basically ready for every single valid trip ID to enter map matching. Uh, graph graph operators map matching routines, and um, I hope this was cached. Yeah. So, so now stepping into Graph Hopper land, we first define some utility functions for interfacing with Graph Hopper. So, um, right, um, and uh, map matching library. So we're gonna. Uh, Attach. We already did this. So this function takes a mapped result from graph hopper and converts it to an array of long lat points because graph hopper returns that. So here it is. Uh, extract lat long uh, takes uh, a mapped result as its input and returns an array of double double and it's just this thing. Um, so what is it doing? It's taking the Match result get so these are all graph hopper specific things right so it's using this get edges method ask Scala because graph hopper is in Java and then you zip with index this is a nice way of just adding indices to something you're zipping so you have uh, uh, an index and then um, I'm mapping the case where I have e and i uh, which will be my uh, edges and the index that I zipped with. So if the if i is zero, then e dot get edge state is fetch way geometry. So I think these are these are yeah. So if if so the, if if index is zero, that means um that's the first entry. So I want to basically be able to get um you know the way geometry information. I think this is all in graph hopper itself. So I don't really recall what exactly all these things are, but let's not worry about it. So it's going to um, uh, this helper function no. is going to give us an array of uh, lat long map match results. Okay, so it's, uh, and then the following create um, creates uh, returns a new graph hopper object and encoder. It reads the pre-generated graph hopper database from the DBFS. This way, multiple graph hopper objects can be created on the worker, all reading from the same shared database. So this is, uh, you know, yeah, so this is something we want to do because we don't want, uh, you know, a whole graph hopper instance to be created to map match each trajectory, you know, each ID specific thing because, because you know, we want to create one, uh, one, one object per, per, uh, per worker. So, um, okay. This is basically what we saw already and make sure it's there. Um, so this function returns a new graph hopper object with all settings defined and reading the graph from the location in DBFS. Um, so in this, this set to allow write ensures the multiple graph hopper ob objects can be read from the same file simultaneously. Um, yeah. So I mean, this is uh, several weeks of Dylan's <laughs> corners thesis, right? So it won't make sense if you don't play with graph hopper locally first. And then the next step does the actual map matching. It begins by creating a new graph hopper object for each partition. This is done as the graph hopper objects themselves are not serializable and so must be created on the partitions themselves to avoid the serialization step. This is super important. This is uh, so we don't want the things that are being spit out by graph hopper to to go through the Ethernet cable, so we want to contain its 
its you know, behavior, performance, or computation in each node, okay? So that's basically uh, what, uh, what we want to do. Okay, so, um, so this was quite a lot of coding. Let's see, so we, we have match trips. Finally, we're sending in Ubers, map partitions, create the map, uh, get hopper, and um, um, this is the, the, the extremely important, uh, powerful thing about RDDs, where we map uh, all the elements in a partition to something. So this is a this very powerful way of, you know, if you have a local library like GraphHop or anything else, you can actually, uh, you know, send all the elements in one partition to an instance of that local uh, operation, right? That's uh, a very important thing in um, RDD. So this is map partitions. Um, yeah, so for example, if John wants to do his equipoff thing in this way, uh, you can do this. And in fact, something we're currently doing is I have huge C++ libraries for reliable computing. So we are doing sort of RDD specific things and uh, you know, we can do map partitions. If we have very well-defined C++ classes, we can call by either executables or Python wrappers, whatever. Then uh, we can only, you know, and some of these structures take a lot of memory and then they react to inputs. Then again, we can do the same thing. So this is a very powerful primitive in RDD. Okay, so um, there's a lot of code. I really, um, you know, it's there if you want it. But let's just do this, right? So let's display the match trip. So we did a match of all these Uber data that's noisy with this map matching Java library using map partitions RDD. And uh, this worked. And uh, so then, um, so that basically converts to this match trip into a data frame. And then this Uber match thing is defining the schema of the points in a map match trip. So um, I basically have my ID, lap, long, and um, um, timestamp. So there we go. Let's turn a bunch of things. <clears throat> and um, now I want to convert the map match points into a data frame and explore certain things about the matched points. So that's the next thing. So yeah, so I'm just sort of ordering by uh, increasing counts, finding the the match group IDs, grouping the ID and counting how many there are. And then finally with uh, spray JSON library, you can actually visualize these map match trips here. So I'm only choosing a couple mm -hmm. IDs. ID is 10193 and another ID is 11973. And um, okay, there's a bit more uh, manipulation to stick it into leaflet. So let's just quickly get to this example. Um, so here's just because I kind of want to point at this. So here is the map matched um, trajectory, okay? And I think the original one was noisy. Um, all right, uh, it, it works uh, in this combination of versions. I, I kind of did this in a massive hurry and then, uh, you know, if you use this, you know, please thank Dylan. <laughs> he worked really hard. <laughs> Uh, before dinner and uh, bed. So this is essentially the most elementary arithmetic ingredient that needs to go into a lot of the problems uh, John and uh, Marina were talking about, you know, from my point of view. Of course, we haven't taken that and, you know, I the other notebook, I think um, I'll just point out, um, this is not fully working, but this notebook um, takes an open street map and converts this into a graph X, which is the primitive underneath graph frames. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, you can take, uh, you know, uh, the same data, um, 
and then turn that into you know so you have to start processing waste and node and once again we use this protocol buffer format and this again is part of Dylan's project from before and we were also parsing Beijing here um, so this kind of almost works but there are some other issues so you know we were now pulling the protocol uh, uh, buffer format for Beijing from the same site and it's all downstairs and then you know you need this combination of libraries is not fixed yet so we're still sort of working on this and um, once you have a whole bunch of dependencies fixed uh, what will sort of magically happen is you can choose this the allowable ways in the open street map so you can say I want motorways motorway links trunk trunk links primary because this is what we thought was natural for the taxi trajectories because taxis don't go on footpaths and stuff so you can choose what the allowable ways are and then you can um, you know define your um, so you have to create an input stream of our portable buffer file um, using this whole thing called the osmosis reader which is part of this open street map coding world um, so so then you know what I'm grabbing is nodes ways and relations so these are just uh, Scala variables uh, through array buffers so I'm going to have my osmosis uh, 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 you know whatever reader just to turn this uh, PBF stream into nodes arrays and relations because remember I'm trying to go after a finite state space Markov chain of the entire uh, Beijing right uh, I don't know <laughs> entire Beijing may crash I might not crash I don't know um, so we haven't fixed this but yeah all the code is kind of almost there I mean it used to work in a different version before so you basically define this osmosis reader thingy um, and you have, you know, you have to initialize the map and close it when it's done. Yeah, so it's sort of work in progress with the latest versions of everything. But usually this osmosis reader run will work. Sort of, this part works still um, with all the extra libraries. And then, um, yeah, this is just doing all the steps together. Eventually you should turn that into a function if you want to just apply it to different uh, maps. And uh, yeah, so this part still works. It's all from last night. So you can see, you know, if I say, uh, give me the, uh, the head of the tags, and so it gives me all the, the, the metadata on West Guan Shang Road. I don't know. All right, there's, this is just, I'm just showing the first element of this list. It is reading, this is all okay. Um, and then you have to sort of get tags, convert that to lists. So you see, this is Beijing in so many different languages, right? I thought that was cool. Let's see, my native language is so this is Bengali, it's Hindi. I don't know. Yeah, so all right, this is kind of cool. So lots of languages. So this is all just in the uh, OpenStreetMap, right? Then you turn the ingested data into data sets. So the main idea is to turn this into nodes and ways. And here's what I'm doing I'm creating case classes for. Um, way entry and node entry. So this is all actually Dylan's work. And then I'm converting the node array into a data set of a node case class. So that's what this is. Because you know, remember each point is our node. And then so I'm, I'm trying to, to get the lat long and convert them into node. And this is what the data sets look like. These things work. So I have my node ID, my latitude and longitude. Uh, and the tags. So I've sucked all this from the PDF format of Beijing, right? In OpenStreetMaps. Now, um, how many of the nodes uh, have no tags? So I can kind of, you know, do some filtering, uh, for example. And then uh, this gives me uh, the way data sets, right? So you have the way ID. So now the beauty is uh, the way ID, a way is defined by a sequence of nodes, right? So now I'm kind of getting to the primitives, mm -hmm. right? So my nodes will become the, the states I want. The only conceptual thing is to course on the graph. This is kind of the heart of it. So I want to specify an arbitrary coarsening of this extracted OpenStreetMap as nodes and ways, you know, and um, so I have to first find intersections because I say, I definitely want my intersections to be in part of my state space always. That's just a choice. Of course, for your problem with mass towers, it's a whole different game. Right, but that's a different problem. So then, uh, yeah, I'm just finding intersections by saying, find me all the ways where uh, there is at least uh, two or more nodes, right? Or find me all the nodes that falls in two or more ways. That's intersections. So you can basically get that. And 
And then the other main conceptual thing is we specify the discretization level. You know, what level do you want? Uh, because you know, I said here's my you know intersection node. Here's my other intersection node. If this is really long, I want to specify give me something every hundred meters. So I'm going to use these extra nodes if you like. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, basically, it, then in the end, you know, it just converts that into a graph X, which can go into a graph frame, and voila, you know, back to the morning lectures, right? So it's uh, we'll make this work in a few days, but so it'll be basically ready for you. So all this means is now you can take OpenStreetMap, convert it into some arbitrary to specify discretization into a Markov chain state space. Now you have trajectories which have been map matched, right? Well, I mean, the rest is just a bit more work, right? So it depends on what you want to do. So these are the primary ingredients to start doing some kind of spatiotemporal arithmetic and models and even test hypotheses and so on at scale. All right, let's stop on time. It's uh, 1701. Is there any questions for the conclusion of this module? Yeah? Yeah. 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 Sure. I mean, of course, not the open street map. <laughs> All this crazy damn. That's work. That's just physical work. But uh, yeah, I mean, you can use graph frames and graph X and all those Prego programs and everything. But you need to find a representation of your data into a graph frame first. See? And what are time varying graphs? I mean, you just have extra time components, right? And so you just think of it as another graph. And that's what I'm doing with Twitter graphs, if you have time varying, right? I mean, the map models are really, really hard there for time varying graphs. But it's again representable this way. By the way, if you're really into time varying graphs, this is one of my projects for a train ride. So Tegra is really um, what you want to read. There is this paper, um, Time Evolving Graph Processing on Commodity Clusters. Well, this is a talk, but there is a, uh, there's a paper. Uh, it's the same group from uh, AmpLab. So this is kind of what I, I really need to get into, but I haven't yet. Okay. This guy happens to be brown as well. Man, so many brown people. Just kidding. So if you go to Cornell, right, like it's really representative of the world population. So it's about a quarter are Chinese and about a quarter are from South Asia. Right. Um, yeah, so I don't know the details of Tegra. Uh, if you get into Tegra, I'll, I'll, I'll buy you beer and chat about it. Any more questions? In the mechanics, like how do you get uh, credit for this workshop or certification? Uh, as I said, it can be as simple as showing me something you can do in Twitter. Like it can be as simple as making sure you know how to get your Twitter credentials and you know putting your favorite MPs or whatever, doing some little things, and uh, you know don't publish it. Just you know uh, just delete the data before you publish it. Show that you've done something. And for this week, so that's for uh, social media. For this week, you can just take that data, you know, before you delete it, continue with some graph operations and, and say something slightly interesting. Right? And if you want, you know, just hit the publish button without the data and tell a story. That could be a good exercise. Okay, have a good life. So I'll see some of you next Friday, I think. Thank you.